Welcome to the next portion of our program. My name is Mark Baldessari. I'm the president and CEO of the Public Policy Institute of California. And we thank you very much for joining us today for this uh, very timely program on the Great Recession and Recovery in California. As uh, we mentioned at, um, at the lunch, this is the first of our annual Sutton Family Speaker Series. Um, and I would uh, once again like to offer our Institute's profound thanks to Tom and Marilyn for providing the generous gift and for their ongoing commitment to PPIC. Tom is one of our board members as well. Just a couple of housekeeping issues. Uh, if you haven't already turned off your cell phone from lunch, please turn off your cell phone now. Or if you turned it off and then turned it on, turn it off again, please. <laughs> Uh, second, um, those of you who know me from the world of public opinion will recognize that you've got an evaluation survey that's come along <laughs> with you today. And we would like you to fill out that survey and to drop it off um, on your way uh, out today. Um, wait, till you <laughs> wait till you hear all the sessions so that you can give evaluations on each one. Pat is already, uh, Pat Morrison, our moderator for our first program, has already told me, well, you've got to move on with this. I'm losing minutes here, and I've got a lot of questions I want to ask. So I'm going to make just a, a couple of comments to, um, to set the context for the discussion. As you know, the PPIC um, statewide survey uh, was also released today, um, and it complements Sarah's report in a lot of, a lot of ways. Um, members of the survey team who were here today, uh, Dean Bonner, Sonia Pettick, and Jui Shrestha, we thank you for the good work. Uh, just Let me just mention a couple of things which I think help set this context um, for a discussion about the recovery um, from the Great Recession. Our latest survey of 2,000 California adults, two-thirds of Californians continue to name the economy as the most important issue. Most everyone uh, who we interviewed said that we are still in a recession. And 60% said that they don't expect economic times in California to improve in the next year. But that's just the sort of the global perspective on how people are feeling about the environment. How do they feel about their own financial situation? About one in three Californians today say that their own financial situation is either in excellent or good shape. And just 15% 15% said they're financially better off than they were a year ago. And about uh, half say that they uh, expect some improvement in the, their finances in the next year. But about a half say that they're also concerned about the prospects of job loss, either for themselves or their family members. So we continue to be in very shaky economic times. What do people think about economic groups in the context of this um, uh, th these shaky times, the economic groups that make up society. 63% in our latest survey say that they believe that California is divided into haves and have-nots. Um, about 48% say that they consider themselves among the have-nots today. And that was one of the findings that surprised us the most because the last time we asked this question, the majority of people considered themselves in the haves. But today, nearly half say they are among the have-nots. And another finding that surprised us was that 54% uh, now say that the government should do more to make sure that Californians have an equal opportunity to get ahead. The last time we asked this question, pre-Great Re Great Recession, um, most people said that um, people currently have an equal opportunity to get ahead. The government doesn't need to do any more. Clearly, People's economic circumstances have a big impact on these uh, responses to questions about their own personal finances and how they view society today, but there's also a political angle as well. In our latest survey, um, about 46% of Californians said that they supported the Occupy movement, compared to 37% saying that they supported the Tea Party movement today. And Democratic and Republican voters are divided on the existence of income inequality, government involvement, and the Occupy movement itself. So political and economic circumstances really um, leading to some very different views today about um, uh, 
income inequality, and um, how we get from where we are to a period of greater prosperity. And now on to the exciting first part of our program with Pat, Pat Morrison moderating a discussion with two very distinguished um, uh, economists who um, will have a lot, of, lot to say about economic recovery and, and job creation. Then we'll have a short break, and then we will we'll resume the conversation with another very interesting uh, discussion involving um, John Diaz from The Chronicle moderating the discussion with Angela Blackwell and Carl Gardino. Um, about building a brighter future in California. It's a very exciting program for me because um, you know I know all the participants and uh, I couldn't couldn't ask for a better lineup. It's just just wonderful. And first, I'd like to uh, introduce Pat Morrison. Um, I've known Pat Morrison for years. Those of us who've lived in Southern California feel like we we know her quite well because she's so prominent in the media scene in uh, Southern California. And, and I'm delighted that she's up here spending time with us in, uh, in Northern California today. She hosts the Pat Morrison Show every weekday on KPCC, the NPR news station for Southern California. She's also a writer and columnist for the Los Angeles Time, where her work has ranged from national politics to stories from the Los Angeles riots to the space shuttle to the fall of Berlin Wall, and you name it, Pat has covered it. In other words, the perfect person to guide us through this conversation. Thank you, Pat. We're delighted that you're here today. Thank you. Pleasure. Um, I usually wear a larger hat with a hat pin, but I figured I didn't need to be that much of an enforcer today. <laughs> I have been known to spill political blood from people who go over their time. But what we have today is not so much what we don't want is a series of lectures. We're not getting them from our panels. You can, you can sign up for their classes for that, right? They can sign up for your class, you get credit and everything. <laughs> what we're going to have is a series of conversations about the economy, the California economy, how it meshes with the national economy. And even if we come up with brilliant solutions, then the next step. Our brilliant solutions may be like putting jet fuel in a Model T, given the state of the California political system. So the questions that we're trying to address, rather than go over the plowed ground of how we got here, is what we can do, or as the kids would say, how to get the economy not to suck anymore. Um, and to that end, we are going to be hearing first from each of these gentlemen speaking about his own philosophy. And then we'll do some questions in the course of our discussion. Then we'll take questions from you in the audience. So I think we'll start with Professor Chauvin and his statement, and we'll go from there. Okay, thank you very much. I, I think all of the um, findings that Sarah uh, summarized uh, are accurate. And uh, California has had a worse unemployment problem. We have worsening uh, income inequality. And uh, everything she found, uh, she and Eric found, I uh, agree with. I did have one quibble uh, about their uh, definition of income, namely, their definition of income is uh, before tax but after uh, transfers. I think a preferable way to do it would have been to measure income after all government intervention, namely after tax and after uh, transfers, and that would be more traditional. But I don't think uh, their findings are any less valid uh, due to their particular uh, income measure. Now let's me uh, try to put California's uh, situation in context. Americans um, the, over the last six months have been fixated by the credit crises in Europe, and uh, particularly Southern Europe. We've heard that these countries borrowed too much, that their credit ratings have deteriorated, that they have high unemployment, and that they cannot solve their problems by printing money because they've given up their independent monetary authority. Um, so I can't help but feel that uh, Americans feel somewhat smug that it's now the Europeans who face these difficult challenges. Well, let me ask how California would stack up against the European economies. Are we much better off than them, or are we in the same boat? California would be the fourth largest economy in the Eurozone, trailing Germany, France, and Italy, and just ahead of Spain. In fact, Italy, California, and Spain would be the seventh and eighth and ninth largest economies in the world if California was treated as a separate economy. So we would be one of the big countries, but we would have a number of other countries of similar size in Europe. Where would we stand in terms of unemployment? 
Well, comparing unemployment rates is difficult, but it sure looks like we would be fourth behind Germany, France, and Italy, and well ahead of Spain. Uh, Germany's unemployment rate is 5.5%. Italy and France have about 8.5% unemployment, and we have 11.7% unemployment. To put it in perspective, Spain has 21.5% uh, unemployment uh, right now. Now, how about California's credit rating? How would we look compared to our European counterparts? In short, not so good. Uh, at least according to Standard Poor's and Moody's, Germany and France still are rated AAA. Spain is rated AA minus, and Italy is rated single A. The debt from all of these governments is rated more highly than California general obligation bonds, which have a single A minus uh, rating, which is sort of a low investment grade. Which major country in Europe would have the same rating as California? Well, the answer is Poland. Um, California's credit rating is one notch better than Ireland, a couple of notches better than Portugal, and way better than Greece. The point of this is that we face very, a very similar situation to Italy and Spain. We also don't have an independent monetary authority. We have limited borrowing capacity. The credit agencies have a watch on us, and lenders are nervous about our fiscal situation. Just like Italy and Spain, we need to address our competitiveness situation. And so I suggest that Americans start looking in the mirror instead of paying so much attention to the problems in Southern Europe. Not that those aren't important to us. What else do we have in common with uh, our European counterparts? Well, demographics, and in particular, government pensions and retirement practices are playing a big role in the budget situation in Europe and here in California. In California, the largest group of public employees has a retirement age of 55, with employees in safety-related jobs, such as police, fire, and uh, prisons, having a retirement age of 50. Now, Social Security tells us that a 55-year-old woman has a remaining life expectancy of almost precisely 30 years. So that, for, by the way, for the men, it's 27 and a quarter years. So if she worked 30 years for California, between ages 25 and 55, she will receive a pension for another 30 years, including cost of benefit, uh, cost of living increases and health insurance. Now, you simply cannot finance a 30-year retirement with a 30-year career. It doesn't matter whether you have a defined benefit plan, a defined contribution plan, you have Social Security, you can't do it if you get high returns on your investments. You just can't do it. You can't do it in California and you can't do it in Italy. Uh, so unless we adjust our pension system and the way we divide adult life between work and retirement, these budget problems are going to continue. A primary cause of the bu budget problems in San Jose, in Vallejo, in California, in Illinois, in France, and Italy is the failure to adjust institutions to longer life expectancies. You might ask why all these budget problems have cropped up now in 2011. Well, what happened 65 years ago? in 1946. That was the first, that's the beginning of the baby boom. The war had ended one year earlier, maybe nine months earlier to be precise. Um, so a lot of our budget problems are related to our failure to get ready for the, the retirement of the baby boomers. Now I have some ideas on how we could encourage people to work longer, but I'll save those for the uh, discussion period. But I do hear people say, Boy, we ran a surplus in 1999 and 2000. Why don't we go back to the policies that led to that surplus and as if it would lead to a surplus again if those policies? Well, I'll tell you, in 1999 and 2000, the baby boomers were in their peak earnings years. You can't play that one backwards, unfortunately. So I think the demographics have changed and we need to recognize that. I also was very glad to hear Sarah talk about the California education system. That used to be a great attraction to California. It's no longer so, and we should talk more about it in the discussion uh, period. Um, but I think uh, in the interest of time, I'll leave it for our discussion. Professor John Chauvin of Stanford. Now we move to Berkeley and Professor Robert Reich. Uh, well, thank you very much. I, I, when I was crossing the, uh, the bay just now, I was trying to think to myself, 
Uh, what could I say that would be uplifting? <laughs> uh, kind of, I wanted to kind of create an upbeat uh, sensibility here. Uh, I, I think I have one, but bear with me. Uh, I want to just start quickly uh, with context with regard to the national and global economy and then bring it into California, and I'll try not to overlap uh, with pr what Professor Chauvin has, has talked about uh, uh, just now. Uh, essentially, this economy, even though it looks like uh, job growth is heading in the right direction, uh, and it looks like uh, consumer spending may be increasing, and it looks like we just may be seeing the first green shoots of a recovery, I hate to break it to you. This is not the case. Uh, consumer spending is up, but consumer saving is down. That is, consumers are spending more because they're drawing it from their savings. This is not a sustainable strategy, to say the least. It may be, you know, make people feel good over Christmas, but we're going to pay for it January, February, and March. Uh, and again, the key problem for the national economy, and California is both a microcosm of the national economy and a more extreme version in a lot of ways, uh, is aggregate demand. Inadequate aggregate demand. Consumer spending is 70% of total, uh, the total economy. And if consumers are nervous and worried, and if their major assets, which is their homes, uh, have declined 30 or more percent since 1996 in value, uh, then obviously there's going to be a negative wealth effect. And if they're losing ground in terms of real wages, the median wage dropping as it is nationally, as it is in California for those who have jobs, and if many people are worried about not having jobs or being underemployed or unemployed, you can see that we're not going to get much spending. And if we don't have much spending, then companies are not going to expand and hire more. Uh, this is the vicious cycle that we are in in the nation as a whole. Uh, and those people who I, in fact, I just this morning uh, debated so I don't know why I do this on television <laughs> I, you know I debate people and the problem with with these kinds of debates is it, it it creates a sense among viewers that there are two sides to the story and one side is as legitimate as the other side uh, look let me just tell you 65 to 80 percent of all economic policy experts in this country agree that the problem is on the aggregate demand side it's not a supply side issue the person I was debating this morning said, what we really have to do is reduce corporate taxes. Well, let me just tell you, corporations are sitting on $2 trillion of income right now. They don't need more money. The reason they're not expanding and creating jobs is because there's not enough demand from consumers. Uh, and we can talk about what we need to do about that as we, as we have this, dis as this discussion goes on. So that's a, that's, a, that's, a, that's a big, huge problem at the center of the California and national economy. Uh, Europe is going to add to the problem, I don't think dramatically on the aggregate demand problem. I, you know, where Europe comes in, honestly, is that the European, big European banks are in deep trouble. Uh, if there is an actual default from Greece, which is increasingly likely, uh, those big banks are sitting on a lot of IOUs that are worth less and less and less uh, as uh, the risks go up and as people don't want to buy them. Uh, and the problem here is that our big banks, Wall Street, is exposed to those big European banks. We don't know the extent of the exposure. Now, how can that be? After Dodd-Frank, after everything we've gone through, how can we not know the extent of that exposure? Uh, I'll tell you why. Uh, because Dodd-Frank is riddled with loopholes big enough for a lot of uh, financiers to drive their Ferraris through. Uh, and uh, it's just simply, uh, these balance sheets are not that transparent. Uh, which is why, uh, if you're if you're an investor, if you're an investor in a bank, you've seen your the share prices drop dramatically. The the uh, S and P 500 would actually be up for the year so far by about 3.3 percent if it weren't for all of these financial stocks that are dragging down, actually creating an, a loss in the S and P. It's the financials that are doing bad. They are doing badly, particularly over the last three or four months because of worries about these. Uh, ex this exposure to Europe, and nobody knows what it is. And I fear, I fear that if the European debt situation gets substantially worse, uh, that we may be facing the prospect of, dare I say it, another bailout of Wall Street. The big Wall Street banks are bigger than they were in 2007. And they, 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 they cannot fail. They cannot fail. That is, the too big to fail uh, is even larger an issue than it was 
before. Now, quickly uh, to California, and then I will really uh, wound, wind this up. Uh, California, talk about the California economy is extremely difficult for two big reasons. One is the California economy is so interwoven with the national economy that you can't, you can't separate the two. It's not a separate economy. Uh, and that means that what the basic policy levers for getting the California economy going are fiscal and monetary policy coming out of Washington. Uh, we, can talk, we, can, we, can, we can do things around the edges. Uh, and we certainly do need to talk about education. But the big issue, the big action, uh, is what's coming out of Washington. And I don't know how many of you saw uh, former Speaker Newt Gingrich's tax plan that was uh, analyzed and exposed today. Don't get me started. <laughs> uh, the second reason that it's difficult to talk about the California economy uh, is that there really are emerging two California economies. In fact, there are two Californias. There are two states. It's no longer north and south, northern and southern California. It's really top 10% California and a lot of the 50 or 60% at the bottom California, moving in completely different directions. Uh, and the inequality that we are seeing in California uh, is mirrored in the United States, but it's a much, much more extreme form of that inequality. A lot of it has to do with the racial and ethnic mix, uh, the kind of, uh, uh, the extent to which we still have institutional racism in this country. Obviously, uh, a majority of Californians are uh, just on the verge of becoming minority. Uh, and that really is a story that needs to be told and we need to face as a, as a, as a country and certainly as uh, Californians. You've got uh, high tech and you've got entertainment, and you've got uh, finance in California, all doing pretty well, pretty well. I mean, these are the cutting edge industries, not only of California, but of the entire nation. Uh, and these are the people who have a lot of education, a lot of connections, but you've got a vast number of Californians who've lost their jobs, lost their livelihoods, lost their homes, are in terrible shape, uh, and really don't see, there's no light at the end of the tunnel here. Oh, I said there would be an upbeat note. <laughs> OK. OK. Do you want me to give it now? It's well, a quick one. I guess, yeah, we can open our presents first. <laughs> OK. This is a small, but it's a significant upbeat note. As the global economy becomes more terrifying for savers, uh, there is a rush into treasury bills. Uh, and that means that the cost of borrowing for individuals and for the government and for the state of California is unbelievably low right now. So in theory, if we want to put a lot of people to work rebuilding the infrastructure, rebuilding our schools, rebuilding whatever we want to rebuild, we could borrow the money at almost unprecedentedly low rates right now. And that would be obviously rational, but politics is not rational. All right. <laughs> Let me start, gentlemen, with a California metaphor and to step back from what it is you've been talking to, so some larger principles. Let's say that the economy was like a house that was built on the San Andreas Fault. There was an earthquake. The house came down. Are we now essentially rebuilding the same house in the same place and expecting a different outcome, whether it's talking about reviving consumer spending or bringing back the same kind of employment that we did before? Is there something fundamentally different that we should do and take this opportunity, as bad as it is, to make sure that we build in some protections and some different kinds of economic considerations that keep us from going down the same road again 30, 50, 70 years from now? Well, I think it's, it's not an easy question, but, but I do think uh, one, one of the things that's uh, changed, obviously, is the economy has globalized. And uh, I think Sarah mentioned, or it was mentioned at lunch, the skills mismatch is pretty severe. Um, there are a lot of companies that can't hire the workers they need. Meanwhile, we've got 11.7% unemployment. This actually leads me to thinking that we need to support and strengthen our community college system, which is where the skills, by and large, are acquired to, uh, for the modern economy. And uh, we can focus on the great University of California system or the Cal State system, but I honestly think the future of California is more about the community college system, and I believe it's deteriorated in at least one sense. 
it's so overcrowded that the students can't get the courses they need. Uh, and so I would focus on education, and I, uh, there's all for forms of education are suffering, but I would like to focus on the community college system. And, and how would that change fundamentally the stability of an economy that many people think is very unstable and insecure at this point? Well, I think it is the, where you could get people the skills that they need. By the way, I don't think the only time that people should go to community colleges are when they're 18 to 22. I think we have to retrain people. The community colleges could be part of, the, of making California competitive, and, uh, and that would help the income distribution. This is a long-term slog. This is a 20-year slog. To, uh, but I, I do think that... Um, to me, that's, that's, I remember, I've lived in California, I hate to tell you how long, 64 years. Uh, I remember when people moved to California because of the education system, and they don't anymore. Not that we don't have some great universities, Robert's from one of them, but uh, overall, uh, it's no longer an attraction, and we have to uh, restore that. And we could work the K through 12 system, which clearly has problems. We need to make sure that the University of California system remains as strong as it has been. It's the best university system in the, in the country, public university system in the country. But I, I don't know. I just tend to focus on the community <laughs> college system, which I think is clogged up. It's clogged up with students. It's designed for 20,000 students. I got 60,000 students. Uh, Sounds like the prisons. It's a bit, yeah. <laughs> But, you know, there used to be a system uh, where if you go to the community college systems, uh, c c go to a community college, get good grades, you can automatically transfer to the University of California. That system is still in place. The only problem is you can't get the courses that you need to do the transfer. So it's, in, it, it's, it's on paper, but the students are really frustrated by trying to make that thing work. Professor Reich, are we rebuilding our house on that uh, fault line? Uh, well, I, first of all, I want to agree with, uh, with John, also uh, expand on that. Uh, it's, I would say, not just community colleges. It's all the way from uh, early childhood education, which we are not investing in uh, as much, well, nearly as much. There are few areas of social science research that tell us so obviously and directly and specifically uh, that the return, the public return to investment is swamps the actual expenditure as early childhood education does. And, and we are not investing. Uh, K through 12 is going to hell. Uh, you know, I would, I would say we've got to uh, invest there as well. Uh, the grand bargain there, I think, is fairly clear. We, we have to, if we want talented people in the classrooms, we've got to pay them more. Uh, but we've got to also uh, demand, I think reasonably, some pay for performance, some linkage of pay to performance in ways that our teachers uh, can understand and feel good about and support, and I don't think, I think there's a way to do that. But uh, th there's a larger issue here. Uh, the, we really do, at the federal and state level, need to understand that budgets, uh, public budgets, uh, are divided into three parts, and they need to be treated very differently. There's, there's what there's, the, there's the obligations we've already made that we've already, that we have no choice about paying. And we're talking there about interest on the debt uh, at the federal level, we're talking about at the federal level, social security and so on. Uh, and then there is a second uh, kind of uh, budget category, uh, which is investments uh, in the future. And we're talking here about infrastructure and education, uh, uh, child health, all the, kinds of all the kinds of expenditures that really are not about today. They're about building long-term capacity, about improving productivity uh, five or 10 or 20 or 30 or 40 years from now. Uh, any family thinks differently about uh, spending on the kid's education than about taking a cruise. Uh, and our federal and state budgets need to understand that categorical difference, fundamental difference. Uh, and borrow against that. If we could change the law and say, you can borrow, we can borrow uh, with regard to our investment budget. I would say that makes a lot of sense. That's what families do. You'd be crazy not to borrow if the return on that investment is greater uh, than the expenditure. I, the middle part of that budget is your expenses to stay basically together, happy and healthy, uh, and, uh, and, and with uh, reasonable security today. And I don't want to scrimp on those. 
or crimp on those, I think that we could do a much better job on those. But there are three fundamentally separate parts of a budget, and we tend to mush them all together. Uh, the other point, John, uh, I want to say, with regard to the baby boomers, and this goes to the changing landscape, the reason these budgets are getting out of control, uh, first and foremost, uh, the projections for the federal budget deficit, and I speak as a former trustee of the Social Security Trust Fund and the Medicare Trust Fund, is the combination of the baby boomers uh, reaching retirement or reaching uh, uh, old age and health care costs skyrocketing. We're now, as a nation, spending 18% of our GDP on health care. And we are getting back for it very little. I mean, relative to other nations, John, you were talking about Europe before. Every one of the nations you talked about basically has a health care system uh, that is available to people and, uh, and universal coverage. You know, we are, uh, if you tried to create a health care system and you said, well, the basic principle of the system is avoiding sick people, <laughs> you'd come up with something like what we have. That is, private for-profit insurers that are trying desperately to avoid sick people and trying to attract uh, groups that are, that are healthier and lower risk. Uh, that's insane. Uh, so that at the state level, uh, and Massachusetts is trying this, Vermont is trying this, I don't see why California should not be at the forefront of this uh, in terms of a, and let me just say it uh, very clearly, a kind of a single-payer Medicare for all system designed around a preventive uh, health care, a kind of statewide, if you wish, Kaiser system. Not everybody's going to love it, but that's the way to do it, folks. So, Professor Chauvin, do you think that's one of maybe two or three entry points into solving some of the economic instabilities, the wild swings, the uh, even, even the disruptions in the employment market, when you find people who stay in jobs they don't like because of the health care, people who would go out into the entrepreneurial market and start a business who said, but I can't do it because I can't get coverage for my kid. All of these factor into these numbers that we see about unemployment and underemployment. Well, we would differ on the details, but I actually uh, agree in the big point that as I think uh, tying uh, your health insurance to your job is a problem right from the beginning. Uh, you lose your job, you lose your health insurance, that can't be a good system. And uh, what he mentioned was uh, more or less Kaiser for everybody, and then you can upgrade with your own money if you want to. I, I uh, would support that in, in principle. So uh, we could uh, work on the details, but I do think those are important uh, aspects. We're getting a little scratching on your mic there. I just want to make sure everybody oh, What can I say? <laughs> Let um, me mention one thing, or a couple things. One is, um, there's been quite a bit of talk that we need uh, comprehensive tax reform at the federal government. We need comprehensive tax reform at the state government, too. Our uh, receipts are highly cyclical in California, and uh, whatever, the politicians don't seem to be able to save the surpluses and uh, fill in the holes. We need a more stable income source for the state of California. Uh, one area where I part ways a bit with Professor Reich is the... Um, uh, I think when you've got a single A- minus credit rating, you have to be a little careful on borrowing. Even for projects with good social returns, you're going to have to be careful that it, it, borrowing, borrowing, borrowing is not uh, really an option. Um, so I think if we're going to emphasize education, and we should, uh, the bulk of the uh, money that we're going to put into education is going to have to come out of somewhere else, and it's going to be tough. We can raise taxes a little bit, but we have to be aware that uh, Californians don't have to live in California. Uh, so we, there's lots of constraints on what we can do. We have to make sure we don't drive people out of California, we don't drive businesses out of California. Uh, so it's, it's a really uh, narrow uh, window of opportunity uh, that we have. It's a very difficult uh, thing. Uh, just to go back to my uh, point about uh, pensions, I thought that Governor Brown uh, looked at this issue and more or less uh, got it right within the constraints of what he could do. I don't know if you saw his proposal, but he said what he, he suggests is that instead of 55 being the standard age of retirement for California state employees, it should be 67. 
Now that woke up a few people. Uh, and uh, I thought. Do it, everybody can do I thought it, right? that was right. I actually had a quote of his. I don't know if I have it simple right here, but he, uh, he, he said, This is not higher mathematics, this is fifth grade arithmetic. Uh, so I thought that was good. Uh, I, uh, about the tax structure in California and taxes in general, Californians perceive themselves to be highly taxed, but there's a hopscotch of taxes, a, a checkerboard of taxes. Kevin Starr, the state historian and former state librarian, had said in the 50s and 60s where we were a high tax, high benefit state, and we are not that now, that a lot of Californians feel, I already paid for that freeway, or my grandkids aren't in that school, why should I deal with it? And Prop 13, of course, has made us very income tax dependent. Of course, that makes it fluctuate. But a lot of the questions raised about changing the split role, that, uh, uh, that businesses are now not carrying the load. I actually went to Forest Lawn where Howard Jarvis is buried, and I said, if you're not in favor of changing split role, please speak up. <laughs> <laughs> didn't say a thing. So, but, but how would you change the tax structure in California, considering that maybe Prop 13 is not the third rail anymore the way it used to be? Well, I think it's worth looking at, the, the, the so-called split roll method. I think uh, uh, moving the sales tax into services, broadening the base of the sales tax, that, that's worth looking at. We need to look under every possible rock to find uh, revenues, and uh, we also need to uh, uh, look for efficiencies everywhere we can. Uh, I know my uh, co-author, uh, George Schultz, has a... Uh, project, I think he's calling it Think Long, which is about California and thinking about the long-run problems in California. And uh, tax reform is, is one of the issues on, uh, on his plate. Um, um. Let me ask you, Professor Chauvin, if California's corporate taxes are in a way as messed up as the federal taxes when we see reports of multi-billion dollar corporations paying no federal income tax, that there's a tax on paper and then there's the tax in reality, back to your Southern European situation. I think that's probably true, that, that they're roughly equally uh, messed up. It's difficult to, for a state to tax corporations because you have to figure out uh, what fraction of their sales came from California, what fraction of their employees are in California, what fraction of their uh, plants are in California. And, but, the, but the last thing you want to do is drive them out of California. So it, it's, it's a, it's a tough, uh, tough issue. I do think, and I don't know that all that many laws and all that many regulations have to be changed, but I do think there is a um, feeling in the business community that California is not a particularly friendly place to do business. And believe me, uh, uh, our neighboring states uh, are pitching uh, their better business environment uh, all the time. I'm thinking of places like Utah and Texas, and but Washington, you name it. Uh, and as you may notice, I always get back to pensions. You might ask yourself, why does Washington have no income tax? A 10% sales tax, which is not that much different than ours. I was at eight and a quarter where I live. How can they do it? How can Washington, the state of Washington, uh, be financed with seemingly so much lower taxes than ours? And uh, maybe a little bit of its property taxes, but I'm not sure I buy that because property values are so much higher here. Uh, I think part of what it is is that, um, you know what their retirement age is for state employees in, in Washington? 62. Not 55 and not 50. Makes a difference. Well, let, let me just say, I, I, it may be, I, I don't know and I haven't looked at California state retirement policies. Uh, it may be that we want to raise the retirement age. Uh, I don't think, in terms of the large picture that we are looking at, uh, that is, changes uh, in the structure of the California economy, changes in public investment that are needed, uh, also demographic changes. I think, I'm not, I'm not sure it's really a, as large an issue, John, as the, you suggest. I, I do want to make one point, though, about business environment. You talk about a friendly business environment. Uh, there are two different meanings to friendly business environment. One is the costs are so low here, the taxes are so low here, the regulations are so minimal, wages are so low, that global capital coming here uh, will make good money, will make a high return on its investment. Uh, but I don't think we want to be in that kind of a world or that kind of a state. The other way of thinking about a friendly business environment is our people are so productive, our infrastructure is so terrific, 
that global capital combined with what we can produce will generate a high return, a high return for global capital. That's the high road, and that's the road that California used to be on. Yeah. And that's the road California is going to get back on. But it does mean public and private investments. Well, I, I couldn't agree more in terms of if you look at Silicon Valley, it never got where it is because it was cheap to live, low wages. It got there because it had great infrastructure for starting firms and being successful. So I agree with you. Now, exactly why we're going to get back to that, though, automatically, I don't know. Uh, but if you permit me, uh, this raises to me one of the most interesting questions of all. Because if California is separating into the top, what, 5% or 10% and then the bottom 50 or 60% in terms of life chances, uh, in terms of wages, unemployment, uh, and also what people need in order to be upwardly mobile or maintain uh, their high quality of life. If that separation is actually happening, and I believe it is, that structural trend makes it politically very difficult to summon from the top 10% the kinds of money, whether you call it taxes or anything else, that will go into investments in the bottom 60%. Because the top 10% can say, effectively, we are seceding. Our life is good. Our children are taken care of. Why should we take care of them just because they are in an artificial entity called California? That is one of the political problems that we face in this, in this state, and I think uh, increasingly in this country. That's why we keep coming back to education, though, because that's the only ladder I know that goes from that 50 to 60 percent to the top 10 percent. I mean, that's the only way you can, you can <laughs> throw a ladder to them and say, we, got some, we have a way for you to get to, uh, in, into uh, this uh, great uh, condition that some, but many of that, us in this room. Is that about. aspirational ladder being pulled up? I think a lot it's of being people pulled up. it is. Yeah. It's being pulled up. And the irony here, and th 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 I had a conversation with an executive from a high-tech company last week about this very question. I was trying to get a sense of how much and to what extent this high-tech company felt it was dependent on the human capital of the bottom 60% in California. And the answer was not at all. That, you see, that, that, that destruction of that linkage is what we have to contend with. What keeps economists up at night thinking about was Sarah's figures about the shrinking middle class. I mean, you think the, the sinking tide sinks all boats, but not very many yachts, I guess. Um, but, <laughs> but, but the consequences of a shrinking middle class, when you've got the whole idea of stability in a democracy vested in an educated middle class, a property-owning middle class, what, what happens when that disappears? What's the, what are the destabilizing consequences of that? Well, I think there are at least two. One, for the economy, you simply have a continuous problem of aggregate demand. Because when so much money is going to the top, uh, and the top obviously save, and that's generally speaking a good thing, uh, but that means that you don't have a broad middle class uh, with a purchasing power to keep the economy going. And as I said before, uh, consumer uh, purchases are 70% of the economy. Why aren't we emerging? from the Great Recession, largely because for, this, for the last three decades, uh, median wages have been flat or declining. And we disguised that reality by women going into paid work, and then everybody working longer hours, and then everybody using their homes as ATMs. But finally, the coping mechanisms disappeared. And so we are left high and dry in terms of aggregate demand because we don't have the purchase, the middle class purchaser to keep us going. The second problem is with regard to our democracy. Uh, and I think there, you're absolutely right. Pat. We, if we don't have a vibrant, large, uh, and confident middle class, confident about their life chances and the life chances of their children even being even better, then we have a democracy that is prone increasingly uh, to a kind of cynicism that makes it vulnerable, I hate to say this, to demagogues or easy solutions or the politics of resentment. The reason you're not doing well is because of immigrants or, or, or undocumented immigrants or the Chinese or, or even the rich or the poor uh, or whatever else scapegoat you want. And that's a very ugly politics. It doesn't answer and solve the fundamental problems we have. The, uh, the, uh, I was just going to point out that the problem with the income distribution is 
primarily a problem with the before tax income distribution. That is, we have a lot of inequality in, in our gross incomes. And uh, the tax and transfer system only changes the distribution of income uh, somewhat, not a great deal. Uh, and so I think we have to figure out how can we improve the distribution of before tax incomes. And boy, we come up empty except skills. I mean, that skills is really our best uh, uh, way of looking. I've, I've looked at this issue for 40 years. I, Joe Peckman, who I'm sure you know, uh, always produced these charts on the distribution of before tax in income and the distribution of after tax and transfer income. The amazing thing was the distributions look roughly the same. Uh, it, that is, so I don't think the, uh, uh, while we can think about whether we want to do more or less of this, but, but taxing the rich and, and, and enlarging transfer programs, that is not the solution. Uh, uh, the, the real solution has got to be um, uh, skills-based. And I think it hasn't been spoken, but I, I, I do think that the uh, globalization uh, is partly behind the uh, worsening inequality. So how do you chase that horizon? Because we all know of people who get educated, exactly as you said, for jobs that then turn around and disappear. You can see even the in-migration of those jobs from the textile industry in New England, to the American South, to Mexico, and then to Asia. And when you talk about jobs mismatch, the cynical point of view <laughs> is that a lot of high-tech jobs are bringing in people under worker visas from other countries to use up their talent, to send them back, to pay them less, and not cultivate a workforce, not cultivate loyalty, not cultivate, cultivate depth on the bench, to use a sports term, in exactly these sorts of jobs that people say are the future of employment in this country. Well, you're asking uh, about a very large question that goes, that transcends California. I mean, it, it really goes to not only the United States, but the same issue is uh, growing. Uh, that is inequality, the problem of, uh, of not only jobs, but wages for the bottom half uh, in Europe and in, even in China. Uh, the, the, the fundamental question here, I think, is uh, how you deal with the necessity, and we all recognize that it's a necessity for companies to maximize profits. Uh, in light of a global economy that is increasingly technologically driven, in which it is possible to be more and more and more productive, uh, using fewer and fewer people, uh, so that the issue of distribution cannot be avoided. Uh, it can't be avoided for the reasons we've already talked about, but for many, many others. If you just, just think about it, more and more and more productive systems uh, all over the world, and fewer and fewer people who are able to afford to buy all the things that that hugely productive system is generating. Uh, I mean, we, we haven't seen anything like this. When, uh, when, when all of the Chinese, particularly from Western China, uh, and uh, all of the Indians enter the global economy uh, with relatively high productivity, because the machinery they are going to be using is going to be very similar to the machinery that our uh, employees, our workers are using, uh, there is going to be a, a fundamental structural I, I don't want to use the, cri the word crisis, that's overused, but a, uh, an adjustment. And we don't know how that adjustment is going to come out. It's not so much jobs, it's wages. Let me uh, weigh in with one uh, thought. Uh, first of all, I think the U.S. wants as many high-skilled people as we can have. And I think our current visa pro uh, situation is crazy if it, if it stops high-skilled people from coming to the United States. Secondly, I think a little bit of the bad income distribution is due to those visa policies. If you have high skills, it's great to keep those other high skilled people out of here uh, because it, it, you create a scarcity of high skilled people and that's partly why high skilled wages have, have uh, grown relative to semi skilled and, and low skilled uh, workers. So it's, uh, it's a classic, uh, uh, almost monopoly power situation. I think we should uh, uh, 
liberalize our visas for high-skilled individuals, and I actually think that would improve the distribution of income by lowering the scarcity rents, as we call them, uh, of, of today's high-skilled individuals. Let me, let me disagree a little bit with that, because I, I worry uh, that if we did that, we reduce at the margin the incentives of companies to train and upgrade the skills of workers who could fill those jobs if there were those investments. And to retain them. Oh, yes. And, and so is, are so many of the hurdles that, that face us then, are these um, the, the hurdles that the state of the economy has presented, or are they political and institutional hurdles? You cannot separate them, Don. I mean, the political, institutional, and economic hurdles are all the same. That is, uh, we would be making much greater investments, for example, in the education that we've been talking about uh, as a country. Uh, if uh, the middle class were not so strapped and frightened, uh, if uh, the people who are very wealthy felt much more dependent on the productivity uh, and uh, the social responsibility and solidarity of the people under them, uh, this is all politics. This is all politics. Uh, I think that uh, what's happening in the country right now uh, is a... Uh, is it, we talked about 2012 as, as, as being a pivotal election in terms of choice. I think it will be, because there are emerging two fundamentally different views of whether we are in one society in which we have obligations to one another as members, as, as members of the same society, or whether we are basically individuals. Uh, and our primary obligation is to maximize the, uh, our own self-productivity. Uh, and, and you, to bring it back to your question of Southern Europe, Professor Chauvin, where you've got people who are either scofflaws about the laws, the tax structure, or people who do what Professor Reich was saying, which is essentially pull up the drawbridge after themselves and say the hell with the rest of you. Uh, well, I mean, I, I don't know quite what to say, uh, although I don't think we, uh, we want to... Um, I think the situation in California is not that different than Southern Europe, but we certainly don't want to uh, follow exactly the same path. It also indicates, while health care is probably important and redesigning is important, that alone is not going to change the picture because they do have universal health care in Europe and they still got these uh, uh, serious, serious problems. Um, sorry, I'm kind of at one note here. I mean, I think our failure to uh, deal with the demographic change is, is uh, very fundamental. And uh, I expect uh, for the rest of my life we're going to have these budget problems. This is going to continue. And uh, Europe seems to be developing, you know, uh, one rescue package after another rescue package after another rescue package. None of that's going to work if you're trying to finance 30-year retirements with 30-year careers. I think the European analogy uh, is appropriate up to a point. Uh, but I think there's something else that needs to be uh, looked at here in the United States. We are richer as a country than we've ever been. Uh, we are the richest nation in the history uh, of uh, humankind. Uh, the fact that we are unable to provide decent education and decent health care uh, to a large portion of our citizens uh, is not an economic Problem. It is a political problem. I'd like to get back to a California question which has to do with real estate and how dependent we are, how real estate driven, because what was the old saying, buy California real estate, they're not making any more of it. Well, in a way they are because of the churn that's emerged, the prices that have dropped. Uh, how real estate dependent is a new California economy likely to be? Uh, are, we look, are we moving away from that? Because you talked about the house is the ATM because people use that in lieu of getting raises over 30 years. How restructured will real estate look as part of that larger economy? Uh, well, I do think that uh, if you look at some of the sources of unemployment, uh, those construction jobs loom large. And uh, I, I think um, they probably will come back. and. Uh, uh, eventually, and um, there was a comment at lunch that we should, uh, uh, there's a lot of infrastructure work 
uh, involved around energy efficiency, around global warming. I, I couldn't agree more. We may want a different kind of housing stock uh, than uh, we've had uh, before. Um, so I, I, uh, I, I do think that, that there will be a recovery in housing, and that will help the economy recover. I think there will be as well. I, I think it's going to be very, very slow. Uh, I mean, when you think of going from 1996, I'm sorry, 2006. I say 1996, 2006. Uh, the reason I know this is because uh, I bought a house in Berkeley. <laughs> uh, uh, not just the year. Not Everybody's just got a real estate story. No, but this is a very important story. Because, <laughs> because you've got to understand, I, my philosophy of investing is buy high and sell low. So I really, I, I thought about where the market was going, and on the exact date I purchased my house in Berkeley, that was the apex, that was the peak of the housing market in 2006. Uh, but more seriously, when you've got uh, from 2006 to today, that huge, uh, uh, about a 33 to 34 percent decline in California, it's going to take a long time. Uh, to get that back. Nationally, you're talking about $7.6 trillion of, of, of housing stock, of, of worth of housing stock that vanished. And the people, who are the people who are really caught uh, in the bond? Uh, they tend to be lower income people. Uh, they were the ones who stretched themselves in 2003, 2004, 2005, 6, 7. They were the ones uh, who, in many cases, uh, were the objects of predatory lending practices. Uh, many of them are minority, minorities. Uh, their net worth has, has, has dropped substantially, uh, given what has happened. And many of them, and this is true of middle class as well, are locked into their homes. Uh, talk about mobility. They can't even go to where the jobs are because they can't get out of these homes that are underwater. I want to go to questions, but before I do, acknowledging that this is not a representative of California sort of room, how many of you have concerns that your children, apropos of what Sarah was saying, will not be as well off as you are? See, even in this room, the concern is substantial. And so would, I'd like to start questions, and I'm sure we'll have some questions about exactly that. We have a couple of people with microphones. If you could stand up, and we'd like to hear a question and not a speech. Get back to the, the baby boomers uh, and consumer demand, which is where you started this whole discussion. There's every reason to believe that the baby boom generation is huge. First of all, it's a portion of our total population is massive, and it's going to hit us for the next 20 years. John, you're 20 years is what we're talking about. They are not going to be increasing demand, consumer demand. They're not going to be increasing demand. They're going to be lowering their demand. There's no wealth effect left there. It's all going in the opposite direction. I don't see how that can be overcome in any near-term horizon by investment in education and in the aggregate now we're talking about. Aren't we really facing 20, 30 years of really soft consumer demand and a likelihood of continued unemployment? Uh, you want to try? I don't know. <laughs> I, 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 I think that uh, we are facing the likelihood of a long term of soft consumer demand, but it's not it's not as directly linked uh, to the demographics uh, as you suggest. That is, uh, the big problem with the demographics is that we're going to have these baby boomers uh, whose you know, 76 million, that's the number, between 1946 and 1964. So we're going to have 76 million bodies that are going to be corroding over the next 30 years, <laughs> all of them requiring a huge amount of medical care. That's the number one problem. The number two problem is that the, num the ratio of people who are working, assuming they have jobs, relative to the people who are no longer able to work, continues to skew the country because we've got this baby boom, post-baby boom hole, very large. Uh, they may, their wages may be better because they are scarce, scarcer than the baby boomers were eventually. Uh, but uh, that ratio is not sustainable. I mean, given uh, health care costs, given pensions, given everything else. Uh, what's the answer? The answer in the United States and every country that's facing a rapidly aging population, I'm talking about Europe and China and Japan, the answer is immigration. That's the only answer. And so whether we like it or not, we're going to have more workers coming into the United States to maintain our 
work, a worker to uh, non-worker, worker to retiree uh, ratio. There's just, well, there's no, we, we don't have a choice. Professor Schoen. What I was going to say is, you know how uh, the weather forecaster at best is good for about 10 days into the future. Uh, and so asking uh, somebody to forecast the economy 20 years in the future is tough. So with that said, I would point out that these 76 million baby boomers are going to be selling their assets, not buying assets. They're selling their 401ks. They're liquidating their assets. Ultimately, they're going to be liquidating houses. That doesn't uh, bode terribly well for asset prices when you've got this huge group selling and not such a huge group buying. The people that are, uh, say, 20 years younger than the baby boomers are less numerous. Uh, so I do think there is, uh, I, I think this may be a, uh, a low growth decade or two uh, coming, looking forward. And uh, that will, you know, have some ramifications about uh, the assumptions uh, going into some of the pension systems, to talk in code. Uh, uh, maybe I shouldn't talk in code. The um, state pension systems thinks that they're going to earn seven and three quarters percent on their portfolio in the long run. Uh, I'm not so sure. Speaking as a member of the corroding class, thank you very much for putting that <laughs> in my head. Another question from, we've got someone here. Can you stand up, please? Oh, there we go. That's fine. Yeah, we'll hold on to um, it. Thank you. Yeah, okay. Uh, coming from uh, University of Michigan and uh, uh, coming from uh, Chicago University, I thought because of education, I moved to Stanford and Berkeley. And what I found, what you said, and I was a president of the community colleges for a long time. And I'm convinced, leave Michigan, leave Chicago, and a community college is the best solution, I agree. I struggled all my life when I was president. We used to have $11 a unit cost. $11 when I left. But all the political issues, Democrats, Republicans, get them out. And I think what we have to do, as you say, how can we put our life into the community colleges and improve the linkages from K-12 to the universities, all the universities, including Stanford and Southern California, whatever you want to do. Okay. We need to concentrate on that particular issue. I 100% agree with both of you. What does it take to make that happen, gentlemen? <coughs> Thank you. Well, I, 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 it's a piece of the puzzle, but uh, unless you tackle the K through 12 problem, yes. then your community colleges are just going to be doing remedial work. Professor Chauvin, nodding your head, agrees. Well, I, I guess I would agree with that. I, I think the community colleges are incredibly uh, important and uh, underutilized. Um, uh, not only, I, I, I want to repeat one thing I said, which is I think there is a role for the community colleges uh, adding skills to 50-year-olds, not just 19-year-olds. And uh, they need more funding, you bet. We have the best There's master plan. I understand. Correct. And then we can create all the vocational area community colleges can be. All that potential if there's the support. Yeah, absolutely. For filling in that, that big important middle. There's a question over here on my left, please. Can you stand up and yeah, lean in there? Thanks. I, I can't stand up real high. <laughs> I'm, I'm older and I'm getting shorter. Um, I want to throw out some questions. Uh, I'm hearing a lot of stuff. Uh, it's all interesting, but I want to throw out some crazy ideas. As an artist who's sort of a mystic who sells health insurance, um, I would like <laughs> to say, yeah, in the 60s, we talked about, we saw all this coming, and we said, why not pay people to consume? The hell with all these jobs. You know, let's drop out and get paid to consume. So that's one crazy idea. And the second one I've already forgotten, but let me just... <laughs> and the other, and I'd like to know what you think about this. And the other one is, why don't we start exporting? I'm seeing this in my business. An awful lot of people are calling me, and they're going to Bali, they're going to Mexico. Why don't we start exporting old people to China and places <laughs> like that where it's they're, cheaper to live and let them consume there and They're going there the for their medical care, you're saying? They're going for, no, not just that. They're, there's a lady who's buying a bunch of little houses in Bali so she can retire and rent them out to other older people who are retiring. 
So I'm just saying, like, let's have some. Can you comment on some? What are your craziest ideas? There's, there's your outsourcing. I'd ask you. Uh, you're not crazy enough for me, but that's okay. You're not an artist. <laughs> <laughs> Go crazy, guys. Well, let, let me just say, uh, your two ideas do qualify as crazy. I, I, I really. Do. <laughs> so, good for you. Good for you. And they're uplifting, just because. And, uh, and I hope. You know, you don't advise some presidential candidate. <laughs> How do you know she hasn't already? <laughs> well, I was going to say something unkind about perhaps you have been. I know it's a few, but 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 let me lay something. Let, uh, <laughs> um, <laughs> when we, I, I do want to make sure that we're all together on on one thing. Uh, because uh, when we talk about aggregate demand and consumers, uh, sometimes, particularly in California, uh, people get a little nervous. They say, well, how can we possibly sustain that much consumption? In other words, isn't it good that we don't consume because we've got the, all these external costs of environmental degradation that comes from consumption? Uh, I think, though, that uh, that reflects a, a confusion between consumerism, which is just buying a lot of stuff and uh, filling up your homes with stuff, with things, uh, and uh, the way in which we're uh, talking about aggregate demand. Uh, aggregate demand can be demand for a, a pure environment, cleaner air, cleaner water, uh, better public health, a uh, better education, uh, better parks, uh, all sorts of things uh, that we can utilize. If we utilize our productive capacity and productive cap uh, potential, uh, we can have a higher standard of living in every respect. And that's really what we're talking about. And this goes directly back the 1960s, so you should feel some I want with those, all this idea. But, I, but, the, but, but where John and I might differ is that everything I've talked about, public health, uh, better education, public parks, uh, all of these things do require a more robust sense of publicness, a public, uh, a, a, an understanding of the connections uh, that we all, all feel, and uh, this thing called government, which every, you know, a lot of people don't like, is going to have to be a vehicle uh, for generating those kinds of public goods. We have Professor Chauvin tap his I inner mean, crazy. I'm not sure I can be as crazy as <laughs> asked, or maybe some of you will think I am. Um, but let me just point out, one thing we haven't mentioned is just how much policy uncertainty there is right now. For instance, how many of you have any idea of what your tax situation will be in 2013? Uh, if you have an idea, you're clairvoyant because uh, there's a heck of a lot of uncertainty. Uh, corporations don't know whether dividends are going to be fully taxed or taxed at their current rate, 15 percent. Individuals don't know, uh, similarly, what the taxation of capital gains will be, dividends will be, uh, what the top rates will be. Well, it's tough to make long-term commitments with such uncertainty. Uh, and I, to be honest, I don't think we're going to know until next November uh, what the tax situation is going to be in January of 2013. That is, there's just so much uncertainty, I think it holds people back. Talk about aggregate demand. People are frozen. And I'm not just people, companies don't know uh, uh, whether to make an investment or not, given how much tax uncertainty uh, there is. Um, I think it's at unprecedented levels, the amount of uncertainty, short term. Uh, the, you know, of course, we just played through it in 10-11. In, uh, in, in that is, we didn't know what the 2011 tax system would be until December 2010. Uh, so that's, uh, it's politics, but it, it's certainly, I think it's uh, holding the economy back. Another question over here. My name's Alexis. I'd like to propose some crazy ideas. I think I'm qualified. I drove across India in an electric car two years ago with Tom Friedman in a solar rock band. Um, I'm, I'm also a technology entrepreneur, and I've spent the last six months at the unemployment offices researching this topic around job skills training. Um, I went to Yale, like you distinguished gentlemen, and then moved to India on a Fulbright to, uh, to kind of see what was happening in India on, on clean tech. Stayed there for three years and started a company in clean energy, which was based in Santa Clara. And when I moved here two years ago, um, after living in India for three years, I was absolutely shocked um, at kind of the state of the economy here, and I guess, and, and the unemployment and education issues. And so 
after my company was acquired last year, have decided then to spend six months in the unemployment offices figuring out what's wrong with America um, as part of my... I didn't, I didn't figure out the whole thing, but I do have... Uh, so I wanted to share some insights that I got. Can you give us a question? So yes. <laughs> my, well, Thank I you. wanted to first share... Um, the, the question is that we need to think about technology, the role of technology, and the two insights I got from... Uh, spending time in the unemployment offices were that, one, people had no idea how far behind their skill sets were. They just had no clue. And number two is that even if they did know, they didn't know what to learn next. But the fact is there are tremendous opportunities in educational startups that are coming up, launching new businesses. There's healthcare startups. There's kind of there's the missing link here and I, that I see in Silicon Valley are new innovations and technologies that can make a difference. And that's what I'm working on. It's called learnup.me. And we're working on skills training. And I think that's kind of a way forward. I want to bring the dialogue of, of technology okay. here. We talked a bit about that. Maybe you could pick up where she left off about what she's seeing on the unemployment lines. Well, I'll, 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 uh, I'll stall while he comes up with a good answer. <laughs> uh, I mean, I honestly think that uh, there is some truth to the fact that Americans are innovative and uh, uh, new technology, and really that is the hope for the uh, economy. Uh, I don't, you know, you've seen it over and over and over again. Things invented in the U.S., manufactured in China. Your iPhone, for instance. Uh, I don't think that's going to change. So we have to, uh, we have to be flexible. We have to encourage innovation. Uh, and uh, technology is, 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 uh, is where uh, America's future lies. I mean, it, and it may be biotech. It may be, uh, what I'd like to see, by the way, is America's innovation uh, come up with cost-saving health care. Uh, I'll just give you one story, and then, then uh, I'll stop stalling. I used to be on the uh, board of a phone company, uh, iSmartphone company, uh, Palm. You may remember the Palm Trio. Palm Trios cost $600. You're not going to sell a $600 phone. There was this tremendous race, which Palm did not win, to make that phone cheaper. And, uh, and it was interesting. Then I ran into a guy who runs a company that monitors your blood glucose continuously. It's a technology, it's an electronic product. You wear a little thing on your, on your yeah, and it was a monitor. So I said, well, how much does it cost? You know what he said? He said, do you know how much diabetes costs this economy? In other words, he was not unwilling to tell me how much it cost. We've got to get the technology of smartphones and the technology of these diabetes meters is sort of the same, but there's no incentive to lower cost in the healthcare field, and we need to get American innovation going on cost-saving technology. Uh, well, I, I, I completely agree with that, John, and I, I think that the two sectors where you have very low productivity uh, and where people feel relatively powerless where technology can not only increase productivity but also empower individuals are both education and healthcare. Uh, and if I were you, if I were a young person today, I would look at those two sectors and say, well, how can we make those work? And how can I give educational tools to individuals that are cheap? And how can I give uh, health maintenance tools to people that are also very cheap? Uh, Beyond that, though, I think that the path of least resistance in terms of our job and wage situation, and I'm afraid that I'm old enough that I tend to see paths of least resistance being the paths, unless uh, there are substantial crises that force change. The path of least resistance is that the local service sector, now by that I mean retail, restaurant, hotel, hospital, surface transportation, child care, elder care, and construction. That grows and continues to grow, absorbing more and more people, but providing lower and lower wages. Meanwhile, your high technology, uh, your design, uh, your knowledge intensive sectors uh, grow, but not quite as fast, and they absorb are best educated and best connected young people. Uh, and therefore, the issue over the long term is not jobs. The issue over the long term is this increasing gap in both wages and culture. 
That's what I worry about. We've got a last question. Please make it short. We'll have a very quick exchange, and then we'll take a break before moving on to the next panel. Very quick, please. There. So Thank you've you. talked uh, previously about uh, jobs programs like a CCC, a WPA. That was certainly played in the Roosevelt era. But the, um, the cost effectiveness at which they did that was really uh, very, uh, most of the money running it through the Army, it went to workers pretty easily. Um, and the infrastructure pieces in Japan as a response to problems hasn't worked really well. And the, uh, shovel ready didn't come out as effectively as we thought. Do you have some thoughts as to if we did spend money to get jobs going, what would be a cost effective ways to do that? I think that's Big you. answer? <laughs> sure. Well, if you, I've spent some time looking in detail at the Works Progress Administration and the uh, Civilian Conservation Corps. Uh, and at least I've convinced myself that it would be much cheaper to do that than to play unemployment insurance and the social costs of so many people. We've got uh, almost half of our unemployed have been long-term unemployed. Uh, many of them are in their 50s and 60s, won't get another job. Too many of them are young people, some even with college degrees. Uh, I would rather uh, put them to work repairing our infrastructure, improving uh, our parks uh, as teachers' aides. Uh, in other words, th there are a huge number of things that can be done that don't require uh, high skills or uh, that are not big, heavy, shovel-ready uh, infrastructure projects, uh, but that are, uh, that are needed. Uh, and uh, one of the problems I think the administration got into was, number one, it overpromised. I mean, the Congressional Budget Office says three million jobs were preserved or created uh, by that, uh, that stimulus, uh, but also it was not targeted properly to where it could get the biggest bang, where the biggest multiplier, that is people getting the money and then turning around and buying things with it that would have uh, a multiplier in terms of jobs. Uh, but I don't think for a minute that WPA and CCC are, are answers to these long-term issues that we've been talking about, but I think they're part of the answer to uh, the next three or four or five years of joblessness. Professor Chauvin? Uh, I'm not sure I can, uh, uh, let me just <laughs> essentially give a closing remark. I, I personally think California needs to become more competitive, not just with uh, uh, China and Asia and Europe, but vis-a-vis uh, -vis Washington and Utah and Texas. I mean, we need to wake up and, and really have a pro-growth uh, environment, and we have to do it in a way that um, doesn't uh, cost a lot of budgetary firepower. We don't have much firepower left. Uh, I think it's a very uh, tough uh, leadership position. Uh, the governor is a very tough job. Uh, I think uh, I, I've seen some promising signs from uh, Governor Brown, but it's tough. But I, I do think we need to be in a very competitive mode. We got to save our businesses, save our jobs, and uh, uh, um, just a kind of a commitment to do that. And we're going to do everything we can to make your your uh, your uh, life easier. Not the low wages and the uh, no regulations uh, solution, uh, but I don't think that uh, until now. Uh, businesses in California have felt that they had even a friend in Sacramento. What a great matchup. Thank you so much, John Chauvin, Robert Rice. We thank them both. <laughs>